Traces of civilizations that were born, grew, and then disappeared over the centuries can be found in most countries around the world. Sometimes they perished from unknown causes, sometimes they were destroyed by the violent onslaughts of new conquerors. The ruins we admire today emerge from the mists of time. Many of them are perfectly aligned astronomically, with huge stones molded into elaborate forms that are truly astonishing feats of engineering. Structures so massive and sophisticated that they would be a challenge even to modern technology. Some of the most fascinating archaeological sites in the world are in Peru. These have been carefully studied for many years, leading to the discovery of traces which range from faint to surprising, impossible to interpret with the tools and knowledge we currently possess. Traces can be found in the ancient remains, in archaic myths, in the oral traditions handed down from lost people, even in the chronicles of the conquistadores. Gods who mingled with men and built fantastic cities bound by massive walls. Mysterious tunnels that are believed to have once linked these ancient sites. Bearers of knowledge and civilization. Divinities who traveled the four corners of the earth and knew how to fly. There is a strange similarity between the ruins and myths found in many parts of the world, almost an echo of a long-lost forgotten civilization, a highly developed breed of superior beings who disappeared thousands of years ago. A mother culture we have no memory of. Attracted by the mystery and magnetic pull of these places, we set off to explore them and capture their essence on film. Lima greeted us in a welter of color and noise. Founded by Francisco Pizarro in 1535, Lima is the modern capital of Peru, its largest city with a population of almost 8 million. We were welcomed to the Lima Geographical Society by the president, Admiral Raul Paramasa. Helped by him and the honorary president, Dr. Santiago Antunes de Maiolo. We consulted various maps to decide on the best itineraries and to see what data the Geographical Society had on the themes we were researching. We explored their library, looking for further evidence to back up our own findings. The Society has some very important historical documents in its archives. Founded in 1888, it is in constant touch with the other Peruvian institutes and universities it collaborates with. Much has already been explored, but there is still so much to discover. There are still unexplored areas in Peru. For example, I found a reference in a book to a temple. I think it was called Tumpos Caica, above Caras, which has two underground tunnels, but nobody knows exactly where they are and nobody has explored them yet. And many other tunnels have been discovered in other parts of Peru. The same goes for Trevin. We don't know all about that either. Trevin hasn't been explored. Next we went to see Professor Federico kaufmann Doig, one of Peru's leading archaeologists. He gave his views on the underground tunnels. There's a book on tunnels. It was published around 1880. All about the traditions. Anyway, what's interesting is that today, but even when I was a child, wherever you go, you hear about these tunnels. I think it ought to be looked into. Not just at Cusco, because we didn't get very satisfactory results there. But around the country, in all those places where people say, there's a tunnel here, there's the entrance to a tunnel. We ought to put all the information together. It's very interesting, it's something that really should be done, to make the past come alive again. Given all the information we had, we decided to start our adventure in Cusco. 
The 600 mile trip in the Jeeps from Lima to Cusco isn't easy. The road runs through a desert, almost like the surface of the moon. We feel a bit alienated. Even more so because the plateaus are really high and the lack of oxygen makes everything more tiring. Tiny clumps of houses break the monotony every now and again. And occasionally, we see the friendly face of a llama or something very like it. Occasionally, unexpected hitchhikers thumb a lift, ephemeral visions which appear out of nowhere. On account of various problems, and even some landslides which had blocked the way, we end up in Cusco after 27 hours on the road, absolutely exhausted by the effort and the altitude. Cusco is 11,200 feet above sea level and has a population of 300,000. The ancient Inca Empire was called Taiwantisuyu. Cusco was its capital. Cusco means navel of the world. Here you can still see the remains of ancient Inca buildings and temples that the Spanish incorporated into their own buildings. Some of them are particularly interesting from a construction point of view, so surprisingly sophisticated that they would represent a challenge even to modern builders. This dry stone wall is really astonishing. Huge blocks of stone weighing hundreds of pounds in solid granite, delicately chiseled and fitted one on top of the other without any mortar apparently haphazardly, shaped as if they'd been made of soft plastic clay. How were these massive stones transported and set in place? How could the people of this ancient civilization fit them together so perfectly without the help of modern technology? The Incas hadn't discovered the wheel, but their building techniques bear witness to an amazing knowledge of engineering and architecture. This stone has 12 corners and fits perfectly into the ones around it. You couldn't get a knife blade between them, but no mortar has been used. It weighs hundreds of pounds, but it isn't one of the largest. On the other side of the building, the stones form a pattern representing the outline of a puma. Amazingly clever craftsmanship. There's a stone with 14 corners on the wall of a nearby building. It's smaller than the other, but the craftsmanship and its polygonal shaping is still wonderful. And there are still plenty of surprises to see in the Inca capital. A promontory rising on the outskirts of the city dominates Cuzco. This is the site of the ruins of Saxay Yuaman, said to be a fortress, or possibly a temple, or perhaps both. We don't really know. The only sure things are the incredible huge blocks of stone used to build its massive walls. Once again, we find shaped stones which fit perfectly together. But this time, we're talking about blocks that are 26 feet high and weigh over 300 tons. An impossible giant puzzle, designed by a superman. Back in the 17th century, the writer Gazilazo de la Vega, after visiting the walls of Saxay Yuaman, said in his royal commentaries of the Incas, it seems as if they were built by some form of magic, a work carried out by demons rather than mortal men. How did the Indios manage to quarry the stones, transport them, work them, and then build walls with such precision? They had no iron or steel to perforate the rock with, and to cut and smooth the blocks. 
They had no carts and no oxen to transport them. And in truth, there are no carts or oxen anywhere in the world strong enough to carry out a similar task given the huge size of the stones and the difficult mountain paths they traveled over. This monolith is amazing. And this one, it's huge and fits in perfectly with the ones around it. Really breathtaking. Saksai Yuaman's massive walls are built on three levels. Each level is a perfectly leveled terrace. The wonderful pattern of enormous stone blocks fitting together perfectly is repeated on each level. The extremely precise joins are repeated over and over again. Who designed and built this gate? They must have been giants. To make a comparison, we moved to a site a few miles out of Kutsko. We went to see a building that has been historically identified as a fortress. It's called Puka Pukara. Puka Pukara means the Red Fortress, so-called because of the color of the rock used to build it. Strategically placed to dominate the surrounding countryside, the Incas were able to control and defend one of the approaches to Cuzco from here. The building technique is undoubtedly less sophisticated here than at Sacsayhuaman and Cuzco. The stones are much smaller. You can see that an attempt has been made to copy the polygonal pattern we admired before, but even if the blocks are much smaller, the workmanship is rougher and the stones don't fit together as well. Our well, doubts increase. Did the Incas really build the walls we saw in Cuzco and the huge structures at Saksai Yuaman? The discrepancy between the sites makes it seem doubtful. We walk over the whole complex, but the workmanship on the walls is the same everywhere. And we begin to really wonder, who built the huge constructions at Kutsko and Saksayuaman? Here we get a helping hand from Inca tradition. Legend says that these incredible constructions were already old when they arrived. In other words, the Incas settled on pre-existing sites, which they restored and enlarged. Inca tradition also tells us about the original builder. In ancient days, after a terrible cataclysm, which had reduced men to the levels of beasts, a being came from the south with superhuman powers. He founded a new civilization, teaching the sciences, agriculture and the arts. He taught men to live in harmony, animated by a spirit of altruism, a being accompanied by followers called the Faithful and the Shining. A being who had incredible skills. He could move in the sky and float on water. One of his symbols is lightning, and his name means God of Storms. He had white skin and a beard. His name was Viracocha. A divinity who could move in the sky thousands of years ago, who could fly, a divinity or the survivor of an ancient, highly developed civilization with sophisticated scientific and technological knowledge. This is what the legend implies, and Saksayu Aman has other surprises for us. There's a strange construction on the summit of the promontory with its massive walls. It is perfectly round, with three concentric circles intersected by walls radiating out in spokes. The circles are enclosed by another square building connected to the foundations of other square or rectangular buildings. When we checked the orientation of the square building enclosing the circular construction, we found that the corners were perfectly aligned with the cardinal points of the compass, and that the walls intersecting the circles run northeast, southeast, northwest, and southwest. 
ideal orientation for determining the summer and winter solstices. Are these the ruins of an astronomic observatory? Who knows? But the concept of the whole building is extremely advanced. There are very few similar examples in the whole of South America. It is certainly very ancient, older than the Incas. Everything we'd seen at Sacsay Yuaman seemed to belong to a remote age, a time we have no human memory of, an age lost in the mists of time. Is this a completely lost story? Perhaps not. Descendants of the Incas still live in the mountains in remote pockets, isolated from white men. Groups which escaped the fury of the conquistadores. Their leaders are wise old men, custodians of ancient knowledge. Some people have talked to them. We were given a place, Samanawazi, and a name, Anton Ponce de Leon. Anton has written various books on his experiences and this ancient knowledge. Inspired by the teaching, he has founded and provided funds for a community where, with the help of his wife, Regia, abandoned children and old people are looked after. The rest home was translated into Samanawazi. An old man explained this knowledge to me in 10 to 15 minutes, using very simple words. But I was a very rational man, and I didn't believe him. I couldn't accept that the truth was so simple. This knowledge is still valid today. It's still relevant despite the passing of time. And I'm talking about thousands of years. This is an oral tradition which has been handed down, intact. These enormous buildings with their huge stone blocks Yes, some people say they were built by beings from outer space, but I don't think so. All the buildings in this world were built by human beings, who certainly had very wise teachers. According to what I learned, these teachers came from a continent which disappeared, submerged by the Pacific. It was the biggest continent of all, called Mu, sometimes erroneously called Lemuria. It was a continent called Mu, a word that comes from a very ancient language and means mother country. The Murians, who for us are the third race, were very highly developed physically, psychically and spiritually a level of development we haven't achieved yet. Moving large, heavy objects represented no particular problem for them. These teachers instructed the people of the Andes, our ancestors who built these wonderful constructions. We believe that the Murian civilization which had reached the Andes went out west too, towards Asia. That's why we find the same knowledge all over the world. Is this the answer? Was Mu, a lost civilization we have no memory of, the mother of all known civilizations? According to the wise people of the Andes, this is the key to many mysteries of the past, but we have other clues to follow up. Kenko is a few miles to the east of Saksayo Aman. Its name could hardly be more appropriate given what we saw. It means intersecting channels. The huge rock, deeply eroded around its base, is carved into a very strange shape at its summit. It's chiseled, carved and molded to create an absurd maze of seemingly random shapes with no apparent meaning. It's incredible. It almost makes you dizzy. What's the meaning of those short staircases, those little platforms, those channels, those balconies? It's a real puzzle, impossible to guess the answer. Did the Incas make it? Was it something to do with their religious functions? That's what we're told, but we don't really know what to think. This disturbing rock puzzle could have been carved 500 years ago, or 5,000 or 50,000, who knows? We'd never seen anything like it. It seemed to have no logic. 
there's a large opening at the base of the massive rock. We go in. Inside is a fairly large cave with a carved rock. It looks like an altar. Later, we're told that the Incas used it for their religious ceremonies. This explanation is certainly in keeping with its appearance and that of the other carved rocks in the cave. But the incredible maze, outside, looks much older, designed and created by other hands and other minds. Perhaps the Incas had found these strange ruins and turned them into a temple, believing them sacred. That's one explanation. The style and condition of the stone seem to back it up. The walls and monolith outside look closer to the Inca style. But not quite. We know there's another site, a few miles away, with similar carved rock. We have also found out about a passage which accesses a network of seemingly endless underground tunnels. Many people have ventured in to explore, never to emerge again. It's called the X Zone. Here we get a real surprise. The rock looks like an exact copy of the one at Kenko. The same patterns carved in absurd positions. Stairs that lead to nowhere, completely off center. Why put steps in that position? Were they for walking on or what? On one side, we discover something that looks like a throne, but it's facing a wall of rock. It's crazy. The rocks at Kenko and the Exxon look out of place, almost as if they were once part of the same project which no longer exists. We search for the entrance to the underground tunnels and get a nasty surprise. The local authorities have blocked it up to stop other people wandering in and getting lost. We feel like getting down to work with picks and shovels and opening it up again, but we repress the urge and decide to be patient. The tunnels exist. All we have to do now is find a way in. These enigmatic sites are very puzzling. Their discrepancies are unsettling. We meet someone who has spoken to other wise men. According to him, direct descendants of the survivors of the destruction of Mu. They live in very remote areas, in the heart of the Amazon basin, isolated from white people. His name is Ruben Iwaki Hordones. He has Indio blood in his veins, and he tells us an amazing story about the origins of the rocks at Kenko and the X Zone. Right here, where the city of Cusco is now. In ancient times, there was a lake. And under this lake, under its bed, there was an underground temple. About 250 feet underground. The wise ones lived down there. The ancient ones who governed the continent wisely. And the entrance to this place was on a hill. The same hill that's called Saksai Waman today. That's where the entrance was. After 10,000 years, there was a cataclysm on the planet. It destroyed the temple and the lake above it flooded. This cataclysm wasn't an earthquake. It was much more. There were volcanic eruptions. Here, too. Here, where the temple was, there was a volcanic eruption. A terrible explosion. In Saksai Waman, there's an area where the lava has solidified. But that explosion produced fragments of exploding rock too. Burning pieces of rock. The force of the explosion shattered the rooms of the temple. And fragments were thrown into the air and fell here, there and everywhere. There's one that nowadays is called Kenko. The Incas found it like that. They found these wonderful constructions and they used them for their religious ceremonies because they realized how important they were. They knew where they came from. 
There are other fragments as big as this room in an area near the solidified lava. There you can see upside down staircases. Well, these fragments came up from underground when the disaster happened and they fell. They fell haphazardly, upside down. And this shows that they were part of what was underground. Once again, ancient traditions insist on the existence of once great civilizations which have now disappeared, and Cuzco still has some mysteries in store for us.